Hi, my name is Dominique Bouchard. I'm Head of Learning and Interpretation at English Heritage. Hi, my name is Nick Collinson and I am an Interpretation Officer here at English Heritage. Today we're going to be talking about this project that we've recently launched out at Rangers House. It is an LGBTQIA plus tour. Uh, which we developed with um, some young people as part of our youth engagement programme. English Heritage's national youth engagement programme is called Shout Out Loud and the idea is that we work with young people from all over England to help share the stories that are both familiar and unfamiliar. And so by working with young people, we want to encourage more young people to get interested in heritage, to find it relatable to them, is valuable to them, but also so that we can do a better job of encouraging the next generation of members like yourselves. Yeah, I think it's really important that young people have told us that they need to see themselves sort of reflected in the stories that we tell, and this is a great example of that. So Ranger's House was built in the 18th century, and in the 19th century, it became one of the grace and favor residences for the Rangers of Greenwich Park. This property had a, a sort of a long, really important architectural history from the Georgian period all the way through into the 19th and 20th centuries. But what we're really here to, tell you, to talk to you about is the collection at Rangers, uh, which is known as the Werner Collection. Yes, so the Werner collection actually has nothing to do with Ranger's house. It's just housed here and displayed here. It is a collection of fine and decorative arts uh, amassed by a diamond magnate, Julius Werner, uh, in the 19th century. And there are over 700 objects on display, so loads of beautiful things from um, ornate medieval jewellery, um, 18th century French furniture, Renaissance paintings, um, we've got Italian bronzes and you can see some beautiful marble statue behind us. So it gives us a great opportunity to uh, look into all the stories that we can tell from these amazing objects. Yeah, and with 700 objects on display, we can't really tell, go into too much depth about any one of those stories. But what we're going to do today is give you a little bit of an insight into a few of the objects which um, have a really interesting connection to LGBTQ plus history. Um, and these are objects that the young people that we worked with felt were really inspiring um, and they wanted to, to share more information about them. So for an object to be considered for inclusion in the tour, we decided that it had to fit one or more of these three criteria. Uh, the first criteria was that it was made by an LGBTQ plus maker. Um, the second was that it depicts a LGBTQ plus subject matter. And the third was that um, it had been adopted by LGBTQ plus people in its period after fabrication, or, or the, the, the thing that it depicts has been kind of adopted maybe as an LGBTQ plus role model. So the objects that we're going to show you today are two of the objects which have probably the strongest and most, um, maybe most familiar connections to LGBTQ plus history. One of them is a statue or a statuette of Antinous, and the other is a sculpture of Sappho. The statue was thought to be a statue of Antinous for several hundred years, although in fact it's a statue of Hermes. We'll get into that story in a second. So the statue is modeled on a Roman sculpture which was known as the Belvedere Antinous, which was purchased by Pope Paul III in the 16th century, and it immediately became a celebrated and revered object. It was so famous and so revered that copies of it were made for Fontainebleau and for Versailles and even for Charles I. But for a very long time, really almost 300 years, it was thought to be a statue of Antinous, but it was only in the 19th century that its correct attribution as a statue of Hermes was finally pinned down. So when the sculpture was on Earth, why did everyone think it was Antinous and not Hermes? 
Well, the answer to that is because Antinous was one of the most recognizable figures in Roman antiquity. Because of his status as the, the favorite of Hadrian, and who was later deified, and whose image was propagated across the Roman Empire, there were loads of examples of what Antinous might have looked like. But I think to really understand a little bit more about why people thought this sculpture was Antinous, it would be really helpful, I think, for us to delve a little bit more into the story of Antinous himself. Antinous was the lover of the Roman Emperor Hadrian. Hadrian was married to the Empress Sabina, but it was very common for Roman men, including many emperors, to take um, male lovers. There was a societal framework within Roman society which allowed for this to happen. So really, you know, this to, to modern day Romans, to contemporary Romans, the relationship between Antinous and Hadrian would have been totally unremarkable. The first mention that we've got of Hadrian and Antinous together is in AD 130 when they are hunting in North Africa. Later that year, the imperial entourage was traveling down the Nile. And on the 24th of October, the Egyptians celebrated the feast of Osiris, who uh, tradition had it drowned in the Nile. And on that day, Antinous tragically drowned in the Nile. We can speculate on the real cause of the death, but we don't know for sure. All we know is that he drowned. And it's what happened after, which is the reason why we know the story today, and is probably the, the strongest evidence of there being a deep emotional bond between Hadrian and Antinous. Because Hadrian was absolutely distraught upon the death of Antinous. He grieved publicly, and this was totally unheard of before. There was no, there was no precedent to this. People were shocked, and um, it, people even ridiculed Hadrian for his, what they called, extreme response. Within a few days, less than a week, he founded a city on the banks of the Nile near where Antinous drowned. Uh, he called it Antinoopolis, or Antinous City. Then he encouraged locals and the rest of the empire to worship Antinous as a god. This was something which was also totally unheard of. Deification, um, that's turning into a god, was reserved for only members of the imperial family. And it had to have approval by the Senate. Uh, Hadrian bypassed all that for Antinous. And this is the key reason why we, why we see there being a, a strong relationship between the two. Hadrian commissioned a court artist, a very gifted court artist, to create an image, a kind of official portrait of Antinous. And this is the one that we recognise today. So for modern LGBTQ audiences, part of Antinous' appeal, and I guess part of his appeal for everyone, is the sort of young, beautiful, tragic boy role that he fills. And he's served as a kind of inspiration, particularly for, for gay men and for gay male artists, for a really long time. Famously, Oscar Wilde mentions the relationship um, between Hadrian and Antinous in his work, The Sphinx. In Wilde's poem, Antinous is the focus of desire and sexuality. And he transitions in the poem from someone who's laughing and has his whole life ahead of him and is fully alive to something which is dead and cold, but still desirable. He gets frozen in that moment, as in the ivory, as, as Wilde says, and he continues in the kind of imagination, both in the Roman world all the way through to today, as, as frozen in that moment of beauty and youth. And I think that's something that, you know, our society, even in the 20th century and the 21st century, has a kind of fascination with those young men who remain beautiful and die young, like James Dean, for example. <laughs>
Sappho is probably the most important historical figure in lesbian history. Her name and her homeland give us two words relating to female homosexuality in English. Lesbian, because she was from the island of Lesbos in Greece, and sapphic, which uh, obviously comes from her name. She was an ancient Greek lyric poet, which meant that she composed poetry to be performed, and she was born somewhere in the 7th century BC. She wrote about all sorts of things, but the, the thing that we talk about mostly today is that she wrote about love, and in particular, love for women. Not many of her poems survive. We know of at least one that is complete, and that is called An Ode to Aphrodite, where she calls on the goddess to help her win the love of another woman. Sappho and her work didn't really survive the kind of onslaught that came after the rise of Christianity, and it's pretty clear that in the rush to move the Greek papyri and the Greek text to the West after the fall of Constantinople in the 15th century, that her work really did suffer. Sappho's reputation was damaged and tarnished mainly by the Roman poet Ovid, who uh, wrote a sort of mythologized version of her life in which she guiltily gives up her love for women and instead falls in love with a man. Uh, that love is unrequited, and uh, she ends up committing suicide. Obviously, that is not what happened, but this propagated her myth. Some Renaissance scholars believe that in the 11th century, Pope Gregory II took all of, this, all of Sappho's works and had them burned for being salacious. But you know, taking all of this into account, it's quite extraordinary that we have as much of her work as we do, and this extraordinary prose has survived into the modern day. Not much else is known about Sappho's life other than other ancient poets and scholars rated her very highly. She is praised as one of the great poets of ancient Greece and probably the best female poet of ancient Greece. Uh, Aristotle actually once said that the people of Lesbos honoured Sappho even though she was a woman. You kind of got to laugh at that, haven't you? I don't know. <laughs> you got to do something. So this portrait is of a woman called Madame Anne de Marseille. Uh, we don't know much about her, but what we do know is that she's intended to evoke Sappho. So this is a picture, a portrait of Madame Anne de Marseille in the style of Sappho. So it was also in the time when Chouinard was working in the late 18th and early 19th centuries that we can really point to a moment when women were holding salons and participating in and creating a, an intellectual culture of their own. And Sappho played a really important part of that. Many intellectual women across Europe identified themselves with Sappho and we can see a kind of growing interest and growing ev evocation of Sappho as a part of, um, as a part of the growing interest in, in women's rights and part of the, the intellectual currents of the Enlightenment. And it's probably this contemporary reception which is the context for Chouinard's sculpture that we have here. So when we look at this sculpture and we think about LGBTQ plus history, we have so many different layers to unpack and unpeel. There's the, the image and the iconography of Sappho that Shinar is, is clearly tapping into in the portrait. We also have this broader context of the 18th century and early 19th century where women are questioning and thinking about their own role in society and looking back to their forebears, you know, the, the, the superstars of, of the classical world, women like Sappho. But in some ways Sappho kind of stands alone in that because she played such an extraordinary role and was so important in terms of the, the literary canon. There really wasn't anyone else like her in, in classical antiquity. So in the same way that Homer, who was the author of the Iliad, was referred to as the poet, Sappho was known as the poetess. So we can get all of this wonderful material, all of this wonderful stories from this particular sculpture. And of course, it's all thanks to the LGBTQ plus history and project 
that we've worked on with these wonderful young people. What I found really interesting about the two objects that we've just spoken about is that very little is known about either of the people that they depict. As historians, we want to really understand as much as we can about the past. And that means uncovering the stories that, the, that history doesn't necessarily want to give up very easily. The lives of LGBTQ plus people are a really important part of that, that history, part of everyone's story. And, as, and what we try to do is identify ways that we can read our sources against the grain, that we can delve into the stories that history has tried to hide and bring them out into the light. You know, history relies on primary sources, you know, evidence from the time that we're talking about. And in many cases, that just doesn't exist in terms of LGBTQ plus history because it's legal status and it's moral and socially accepted, well, it's lack of moral and socially acceptance, it meant that people didn't write down their thoughts about this, or if they did, they wrote a letter and then it was systematically destroyed. So it's often a real detective job to try and under uncover these stories. Projects like Out at Ranger's House and other programs around are really important because they give us really important insights into the lives of people in the past. And as we try to tell the fullest possible story of England, these, are, these people's stories are a really important part of that. Another thing in telling LGBTQ plus history that adds more complexities to it is terminology. You know, words that we use today like lesbian, bi, gay, trans, non-binary, they are relatively new terms which would not have been understood at all in the past. I mean, we've been looking at two figures from the ancient world today and back then the whole notion of sexuality as an identity would just not be understood at all. So, you know, we can't say that Hadrian was homosexual or bisexual. That, it, it's meaningless. I think that, I think Nick's, Nick's absolutely right. And as historians and as heritage professionals, we always want to be really accurate and precise in the things that we say, and also be really clear about the limits of our knowledge. So good history tells you what it knows, and it also makes it really clear where we're in the area of speculation. No speaking is left in me, no tongue breaks, and thin fire is racing under skin, and in eyes no sight and drumming fills ears, and cold sweat holds me and shaking, grips me all greener than grass, I am dead, or almost I seem to me. And this is about how seeing someone that she loves and, is, and desires makes her feel, and it just feels really, feels really modern, um, and it feels really human, and so, that's another contrast for me between Antinous, who's become a, a god, of course, um, after his death, and of course this image of the god uh, Antinous and that cult figure is, you know, is an idealized person, um, and yet Sappho, who's even farther back into the past than Antinous, and whose story we have just through little scraps and fragments of papyri, um, is, feels so fresh and so modern and so human and so relatable. So I, I think there's a really um, lovely contrast there that, that, this, uh, that you know, visitors on this tour can, can really explore for themselves. Some of the other objects on the tour include a beautiful bronze statue of Saint Sebastian. And he's an interesting one because he is a, an example of a figure from history who has actually been adopted by the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, he was seen as a figure of hope during the uh, AIDS crisis of the 1980s and 1990s and it's nice to be able to um, sort of bring a sort of modernity to these ancient objects. <laughs>
You've got, you've got a favourite, haven't you? I do. Um, one of my favourites on the tour is a small gold seal by a Renaissance artist called ben Benvenuto Cellini. Um, he himself thought he was one of the greatest artists that ever lived and probably would ever live. Um, in the mid-16th century, he was uh, convicted of sodomy and went to prison. And then when he came out, he started writing his autobiography in which he details his um, liaisons with men and women, he talks about art, he talks about his philosophy, and it is quite a wild read. So um, I think that it's one of, uh, it's a small object, it's very beautiful, but it, it can be a gateway into this really incredible story, um, which I think is really exciting and very, uh, very interesting. Yeah, there's some really great stories to be told, and <clears throat> I think something that will probably speak to everyone. While this tour is for everyone, I, it, I think it will have a deep resonance with LGBTQ plus young people who, you know, put the thing together. Yeah, I think it's really inspiring when young people tell us um, that they find history interesting. And, you know, as part of our, our role as an organization, as a charity, is to try to get as many people interested and understand the value of these collections, of, of the National Heritage Collection, these properties. It's been a really wonderful opportunity for us to be able to to reflect on the collection through fresh set of eyes. So do come to Ranger's house, take the tour, also see the rest of the collection, it is amazing. The collection is a treasure trove of incredible objects, really beautiful, really interesting, and all of them have wonderful hidden histories behind them, which uh, the volunteers and staff at Rangers, I'm sure, will be really excited to share with you. So, yeah, hopefully that has given you a flavour of um, Out at Rangers House, this LGBTQ plus tour designed by young people. Um, do come to Rangers House, take the tour yourself, uh, see the other objects in the collection. There is so much to discover here. <laughs>